Before we start, if you're enjoying these conversations, please make sure that you like or subscribe to Cleaning Up. It really helps other people to find us. Cleaning Up is brought to you by the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation. Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich, and this is Cleaning Up. My guest today is the Deputy Secretary of Energy of the United States, David Turk. Before taking up that position with the current administration, he was the Deputy Executive Director of the International Energy Agency. There, he served as head of the Strategic Initiatives Office and also was Director of Energy Environment. Please welcome David Turk to Cleaning Up. Mr. Deputy Secretary, David, how are you? I'm terrific. It's uh, great to see you, Michael. Now, um, our paths managed not to cross at COP26. I assume you were there throughout? I was there for the second week, and uh, my boss, Secretary Granholm, was there for the first week. Ah, okay. So this explains a lot because my second week was very disrupted. Um, I had rented this castle for the full two weeks, the Blair Estate, uh, outside Glasgow, and was happily hosting sessions. Then my wife came to visit, um, was tested positive for COVID, Ooh. and I left. So we didn't interact. We didn't overlap. Well, I hope she's okay. Is uh, everything okay? Oh, yes, absolutely. She's, uh, right, she's right. recovered and, and we're good. But I did miss uh, the second week uh, of, um, of COP, which is probably why it was uh, such a success in many ways. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't think that's the case. And it's been uh, just terrific, Michael, to know you for many, many years now and having our paths crossed many, many times uh, in the previous past. And, and indeed, I'm looking forward, I'm sure, you know, during the course of this conversation over the next half hour or so, we will find many touch points and perhaps some things that we'll end up working on. And I, I'm pretty sure our paths will cross now that uh, travel is becoming uh, allowed again. Um, give us the thumbnail. I mean, I haven't uh, spoken to you since you left the IEA uh, and went back into government. Um, so you know, talk to me about the sorts of things that you've been focusing on. What have you been doing? Well, absolutely. And, and I have to say, Michael, and you know the IEA and uh, my old boss, Fatih Burrell, well, phenomenal organization to be a part of. And I really enjoyed my five or so years that I was there and ultimately becoming uh, Fatih's deputy and just phenomenal world-class expertise. Many, many colleagues that we both know very well, some of the best modelers in the, uh, in the business. So uh, since I took this job, which is now coming on about a year, it's been about 11 months since, uh, since I was uh, nominated and then confirmed as deputy secretary, it's been an awfully busy year. I was just talking to Secretary Granholm the other day, uh, and in some ways it feels like it's been five years, and in some ways it feels like it's just gone by that quickly when we're trying to do so much. And uh, we're coming in with a very, this administration has a very ambitious climate agenda, rightfully so in terms of the climate imperative, but also focused on environmental justice, focused on making sure that we can make this transition in a way that works for communities and that revitalization from an industrial supply chain perspective as well, and trying to do all that at once. And we're both using existing authorities, existing funding streams, including very ample funding that the Department of Energy gets for research and development. Uh, we've been a innovator in the clean energy space for many, many years, our 17 national labs, but also now uh, deploying a whole range of new uh, authorities, new funding, $62 billion that Congress gave us in the bipartisan infrastructure legislation just for the Department of Energy to focus on nearer term clean energy deployment demonstration. Uh, exciting, incredibly exciting to be a uh, department at this time. Right. And uh, some of that money um, is going through um, the, the office of Jigar Shah, who was on Cleaning Up. He was actually one of our early guests on episode uh, nine in something like, I think it was September 2020. So a few months later, he was um, he was given the call up and he became part of your operation there. So uh, now he's running this uh, loan office for scale up, is he not? Um, and, and how much of the fund, I mean, you, you mentioned there the national labs, and then you've got the scale up, and then you've got presumably lots of other things. How are you, how do you split your resources? Yeah, so the way to think of the Department of Energy is uh, historically, and for many, many years, we've had a very robust office of science and our research and development on solar, on wind, all, all types of clean energy. And that's been very robust to the tune of uh, eight or so billion dollars a year that we spend on related efforts. Um, and we've got these 17 national labs. I've had a chance during my time as deputy secretary to visit many of them. 
phenomenal world-class expertise, tens of thousands of incredibly talented top scientists, not only in the U.S., but they attract top scientists from around the world working on the cutting edge technologies. And these uh, efforts in the past have led to developments on the solar PV side, have led to developments, uh, untold developments in a variety of other clean energy applications. So DOE has always been a powerhouse as far as that R&D and that innovation side. What DOE has lacked, uh, frankly, is a lot of demonstration deployment levers that you see in a lot of other uh, comparable energy departments around the world. The loan program is actually probably the most robust near term deployment demonstration effort that we've had for many years. One of the loan programs uh, earlier uh, loans was to Tesla. At a critical point in Tesla's, uh, uh, as Tesla was just starting out, and one could say that Tesla wouldn't be what Tesla is now without the loan program coming in at a critical early time, providing that additional funding at that early stage, which allowed Tesla and any number of companies, including our utility scale PV. On that one, I'm smiling because that came up in my conversation with Mariana Matsukato, who claims that um, that that Tesla only exists because of that grant. There was a, a actually it was a loan, not a grant. Uh, That's I think right. Four hundred and fifty million dollars, something like that, was paid back early. And um, so she claims Tesla as a total win for big government. And, um, and, and I have actually subsequently had a bit of a sniff around some of the investors, some of the equity investors say, well, had you not got that, uh, the, that loan, what would have happened? Would you have folded the company? And they say, yeah, of course not. But I mean, so I laugh because it's one that just keeps bobbing up and rearing its head in, uh, in these conversations. Well, but it, I'll, give you, I'll give you at least an assist on Tesla. <laughs> we'll, t- we'll take the assist and it's fascinating. You talk to some people, Mariana, you talk to others who are involved in the loan program and they say it's was absolutely at a critical point in time for Tesla when the private sector was not as uh, forward leaning in these kinds of uh, loans as it is now. And they say it's absolutely critical to that development. Others would say um, that maybe there was uh, an alternate path or whatnot along those lines. But what Jigger's doing, and Jigger is such a talent, it's just phenomenal that he decided to come into the uh, federal government. Uh, Jigger and I actually grew up Uh, very close to each other in the middle of uh, practically nowhere in the state of Illinois. Our parents actually knew each other. uh, And it's just been a pleasure to have Jigger part of the department. And he's revitalizing the loan program. After that initial flurry of loans to Tesla, to some of the initial utility scale PV uh, companies, other key clean energy technologies, the loan program has sat dormant for uh, quite a few years in terms of any new loans coming through the system. And Jigger has just done a phenomenal job revitalizing the loan program. So we had our first loan for many, many years uh, come through late last year, and we've got many, many others that are teed up. Uh, 2022 is going to be a big, big year for the loan program. But the loan program is just now one part of a variety of different levers, authorities. The $62 billion is 60 new authorities, 60 new programs that we've got at the Department of Energy Uh, Probably the one that's getting the most attention is what's called the OCED, the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, which has 20 plus billion dollars to do large scale demonstration programs on hydrogen, on CCUS, on some other key, uh, key clean energy technologies. And that's always been the real challenge has been that kind of what they call the value of death. It's been the demonstrators and the O1 projects. Once you get out to to project number two to number three, you've got so much creativity, particularly in the US financial system, that those have not been a problem, but that value of death has really been where a lot of technologies have floundered. Well, that's exactly right. You know this, Michael, you've studied this for many, many years. And what's exciting from the government and from the Department of Energy perspective is we now have these new authorities, we have these new funding streams that allow us working hand in hand with the private sector, working hand in hand with investors to try to fill in that valley of death and have a very robust Uh, 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 conveyor, a very robust package of assistance that we can help on the innovation side to the R&D side to the demonstration side. And we're looking for some additional uh, legislation passed from Congress on the uh, tax incentive side of things, which can be an incredibly important pull for these technologies coming out. And as you know, the climate science is unforgiving here. We've got to accelerate our ability to get these clean energy technologies at scale out into the marketplace like we're starting to see with EVs, but we need a variety of clean energy technologies out there. 
let's talk about some of the earlier technologies. Uh, and could you touch on, there's a, um, a, also an organization or a, a facility which has been uh, much loved of many people, uh, which is ARPA-E. How's ARPA-E doing in the new constellation? So ARPA-E is doing great, and ARPA-E is such a uh, terrific resource for us to have in the department. Let's explain what it is, Can in your words. Yeah, so ARPA-E was created, and a real credit to Arun Majumdar, who was the uh, head of the first head of ARPA-E, and this is back in the uh, Secretary Chu days uh, in the early Obama administration. And the idea was uh, we do all sorts of great R&D. We have an office of science. We do a lot of cutting-edge uh, innovation in our labs and at universities. But let's take some lessons from DARPA, which was the Department of Defense kind of early stage technology, high risk, high reward kind of bets, and set up a separate part of the Department of Energy, put it outside some of the bureaucratic uh, challenges that we sometimes have in the federal government. They have a very unique hiring structure where they bring on people, top experts in fields for just a few year period of time, and they do higher risk, higher reward, earlier stage R&D, uh, and I think it's just been a phenomenal experiment. It's to the tune of about a half a billion dollars a year that we spend on ARPA-E these days. It's had strong bipartisan support from Congress, uh, and it's been able to do some really cutting edge early stage efforts. And what we're trying to do at the department is affiliate ARPA-E with the Office of Science, with our Energy and Efficiency and Renewables Office, with this Clean Energy Demonstrations and the loan program, put it all uh, in a coherent package so we're taking a crack at all parts of the innovation cycle in a much more robust way from, uh, from the U.S. Department of Energy side of things. Are there any names that spring to mind coming through that process at any stage? Some, some you know, what are, your, what are your favorite children, either past or present? Yeah, that is a good question. There's an awful lot of them, and that's one of the advantages of RPE. What they do is they put out uh, requests, uh, funding opportunities on specific technologies, and then what they've been doing more and more is actually having some open funding. So we don't dictate the boxes, right? Part of this is thinking outside the box. And so these open funding requests actually have the ability for the private sector, university folks, others to come in and say, here's a bank shot approach to get to this, or here's some other effort along those lines. So there's a huge, huge, I'm sure the RPE website and every year RPE does a big innovation summit. Uh, any number of key companies and key technologies. And it's been around long enough that we're starting to see some of those things that were incubated in ARPA-E actually coming out there as significant uh, players in the, in the so-called real world. Right. It was maybe unfair to ask you to sort of name favorite children, but I know that there's some extraordinary stuff coming out in solid state batteries, uh, in hydrogen, in some of the kind of transactive grid digitization side of things. And it's, it, is a, it is a very exciting sort of uh, funnel, at least the beginning of the funnel. Now, but you have also, uh, going back to the times of um, Secretary Chu, who was also, by the way, a guest on Cleaning Up. We've had uh, uh, Secretary Chu on and uh, Secretary Moniz as well, as it happens. But going back to Secretary Chu's days, there was this thing called the uh, the Sunshot. And you've now got a number of prizes or focus areas. Uh, you're calling the earth shots um what do you what are the earth shots well it really is looking at uh sunshot as a model and um i would happen to be on the uh, transition team in the u.s government unlike a lot of other governments we have a significant lag time from when the election happens to when the new administration actually takes place a several month period of time and so what the new administration does is they bring in a, a couple dozen people for each department and they say, do a bunch of intellectual work here. Try to figure out what plans can be put in place that the new administration can execute on. So I happen to be the deputy of that transition plan. Uh, my colleague, Arun Majumdar, the head of ARPA-E, the first head of ARPA-E, and one of the fathers, grandfathers, godfathers of Sunshot happened to be the head of that transition team. So part of the work we did in that transition was think through, how can we bring more coherence in terms of how we do R&D? especially for those key areas that we really need to accelerate the timelines on innovation. And we decided to look at SunShot and model a series of earth shots uh, after SunShot focused on those key net zero technologies that we still need to have some significant cost reduction. Some technologies, solar PV is a good example, uh, is cost competitive and cost favorite, uh, as you know very well around the world. And we should, and, we uh, should say this, we should just, in, uh, sorry to interrupt, but just to, for those who not, haven't listened to the Secretary Chu episode, the sunshot was to get the cost of solar PV from, I think it was like five bucks uh, down to one buck. 
uh, by the end of uh, the the decade in question, which would have finished in 2020. And of course, it was enormously outperformed, was it? Uh, so that, that was the model. That's exactly right. And it was both the hard technology costs, but also the soft costs as well, uh, um, looking at how these technologies really need to take off in the real world. So what we did is in this new administration, and credit to Secretary Granholm, who's just been a phenomenal leader more generally for us at the department, including on the earth shots, we've launched now three earth shots, and we're going to launch several more uh, in 2022. And it's looking at those key technologies we need to have those significant cost reductions on the scale of what happened in Sunshot. So the first one that we launched was on hydrogen. A lot of countries, a lot of companies focused on clean hydrogen around the world. And we set ourselves the goal by the end of this decade to get down to a dollar per kilogram of clean hydrogen uh, produced. Second one was on long duration energy storage, reducing the cost of long duration over 10 hour storage, uh, 90% from where it is currently. So dramatic cost reductions. A third one on carbon negative technologies, direct air capture, but other technologies beyond the mechanical for that critical part of the equation. And so these are game changers in the innovation side. What they allow us to do internally is work with RPE, work with our national labs, have a coherence to our programs so that we're making sure that we're exciting our uh, lab workers, exciting our professionals, but having a coherence among what we do at the Department of Energy and beyond that in the US government and then for external purposes is work public-private partnerships to try to show the market that we're doing everything we can from the U.S. government side of things to reduce those costs. And the private sector should take notice and make some investments. And we hope this accelerates clean hydrogen. We hope this accelerates long duration storage, the carbon negative technologies. And then we'll announce uh, some more uh, earth shots coming up. So I think it's one of, the, one of the things I'm most proud of that we did in 2021 in this new administration. I think that's great. And it'd be, um, you know, they're brave because you set the targets and then you either hit them or you don't. And, you know, my sense is probably the hydrogen one. I'm pretty sure you'll get to the um, the long duration. I would have liked to have seen long duration defined as beyond uh, 48 hours. I think 10 to 48 hours is almost too easy. You can kind of win without winning. And then the direct air capture, I got to be honest, I'm, I'm very uh, skeptical about anything, you know, mechanical direct air capture or, or um, you know, I, I, the, I like the bio, but I like trees. Trees are good. They're just not, not going to be enough trees of them. Around with. <laughs> trees yeah. have been around with us for many, many years. Yeah. But my suspicion is that any solutions will have to have something bio, biomimicry maybe, but at, at their core, because uh, as soon as you have fans and chemicals and reagents and uh, so on, I, I'm, I'm feeling that's going to be very expensive. Well, and it's a technology agnostic approach, right? We set those key goals of what price points we want to reach to and then let innovators innovate and let a variety of key technologies come out. And then we provide a significant amount of uh, our Department of Energy and U.S. taxpayer funding. So the long duration energy storage one is about a billion dollar per year budget. So these are significant amounts of efforts we're investing for uh, us to be able to achieve those dramatic cost reductions. And we try to we spend a lot of time setting those goals and we try to hit a sweet spot from something that's very, very ambitious, right? These are not meant to be easy things. They're not conservative estimates of where we should be able to get to. And if we get to them before the end of the decade, great, right? We're trying to race. This is a race against uh, the, the climate change impact. So we're trying to go as quickly as we can. Now, let's go back to the international stuff where we started. We talked about COP26. Uh, you were there. You, you, um, you didn't overlap with, uh, with your boss, with Secretary Granholm, but you were there. Um, what were you working on? How do those programs, you've just described essentially uh, the domestic programs, how do they then interlock into the international uh, position of the US? And of course, the context here is that you have pledged net zero by 2050. Or you, uh, President Biden, pledged uh, net zero by 2050. Well, absolutely. And it's exciting to see many, many countries and companies around the world pledging net zero uh, as well. I think we've seen remarkable progress on there. Um, the key challenge, of course, is actually implementing and actually getting this, uh, getting there in the real world and doing the hard work now instead of your traditional college student who does the procrastination and putting off the hard work until closer to 2050. So I'd say three things that uh, I was really focused on. One was um, really uh, showing and having conversations with other energy ministries, other energy ministers around the world. Those are the parts of the governments that are really implementing these kinds of things domestically in their own countries. And I had a chance to travel 
uh, to India, to some other countries, including with Secretary Kerry uh, on some of his trips uh, in 2021 before the COP. And uh, uh, what we do in the U.S. matters an awful lot. A, we're a significant part of global emissions, a decreasing percentage of global emissions, especially as China's percentage increases and some other countries increase. Um, but we're an innovation hub. Uh, we're a uh, technology powerhouse from the private sector and the public sector. And for instance, when I was in India meeting with, I think it was five or six different energy ministers and ministries at the time, uh, it was so reassuring to me that the key technologies we're focused on with our earth shots and some of our other levers are those technologies that India would love to have the costs low enough on so that they could take full advantage of. So when I met with the energy minister, the power minister in India, his two priorities that he outlined above all the other things they're trying to do on solar PV, et cetera, was hydrogen and energy storage, long duration energy storage. And those happen to be the first two earth shots that we launched. And um, you could just tell how much he wanted us to succeed in our cost reductions because that then allows them to be successful on their incredibly ambitious hydrogen mission that Prime Minister Modi has put on the table on their storage efforts as well. So there's a dovetailing of what we do domestically with what others do domestically and comparing notes and inspiring each other uh, on that front. Secondly, uh, we launched something, Secretary Granholm with Secretary Kerry and others launched something called Net Zero Labs. And the idea is just as we're taking advantage of this phenomenal world-class national lab expertise, some of those national labs have actually done some work with India, with Indonesia, with South Africa, with Mexico in the past. And our sense is if we can have those countries benefit even more so and more directly from some of this world-class independent expertise, it's not a consultant, it's not trying to sell products or anything like that. It's just trying to help these countries think through their net zero pathways what they can do in the near term, tailoring some of that world-class expertise for ways that help Indonesia be more successful to do what they're trying to do in terms of reaching their targets. So we've launched this Net Zero Labs initiative, which I think is a real game changer in terms of how that can help uh, countries around the world, key developing countries uh, around the world move forward. Now, is, is that the same, can I ask, as Net Zero World? Because I, I'm aware of the Net Zero World launch, which NREL is in the National Renewable that's Energy right. Lab the is same. coordinating, it's the same and that's presumably the same. So you're founding it on, on the labs, but it's the uh, the Net Zero World, Net Zero Labs initiative. That's right. Let, but let me, let me challenge you here, because um, in the early days of the last administration, uh, I had a conversation with Secretary um, Perry, Rick Perry, and he said, Everybody talks about this stuff. They all talk about low carbon. They talk about renewables. They talk about, you know, the climate change. But let me tell you, when I travel around, particularly in Europe, as soon as the door is closed, they say, can you sell us some of your nice, cheap natural gas, fracked natural gas? We can't frack in Europe, but we'd love some of yours. And of course, now we're living through this incredible price spike and energy tension partly being you know, stoked by Mr. Uh, President Putin and partly because of a confluence of other uh, uh, situations. But do you not get people closing the door and saying, OK, Dave, I love net zero world, net zero labs. I love hydrogen. I love long duration storage. You know, it's all great. But come on, we need the natural gas. So it's been fascinating, I have to say, Michael, and uh, Department of Energy is a real world ministry, right? We've got real world issues that we're dealing with on a daily basis, high price of gasoline at the pump, uh, you know, those kinds of issues at the same time that we're trying to do our part uh, to accelerate the clean energy transition. And uh, what we say, and I have to say, there seems to be a pretty good convergence of this, how we execute on this two-part strategy I'm going to lay out is another thing. But um, one is, and I think it's a very credible argument, uh, we're trying to do this in the U.S. context, if we had more uh, diverse supplies of clean energy right now in ways that work from a climate perspective, ways that work from a national security perspective, from an energy security perspective, that is a good, good thing. Uh, if Europe, for instance, had even more uh, clean hydrogen in the system than it does right now, right, we're just at the stages of actually getting electrolysis and green hydrogen uh, at some significant quantities. If we had even more electric vehicles, if we had more offshore wind, if we had more onshore wind, if we had geothermal, if we had the full range of clean energy supply out there, uh, Europe would not be in the situation it is right now where it depends on so much of its heating and industrial capacity from Russian natural gas, right? And that puts a pressure not only on the price 
volatility of relying too much on one natural or one uh, commodity, whether it's natural gas or uh, oil, uh, which the world relies upon, large parts of the world rely upon so significantly. So the argument that we need to accelerate our clean energy transition even more, given the volatility of these commodities, is something that resonates. Uh, and it's not going to happen overnight, right? It's not going to be like we wake up tomorrow and we have a full clean, clean hydrogen system at the price points that we wanted at, uh, et cetera. And then the second thing, which uh, you just uh, alluded to or explicitly put on the table, is countries having to deal with that near-term pressure of providing for their constituents, providing for their citizens uh, for industrial purposes, for heating purposes, for transportation purposes. Last year, we saw 10% of global uh, cars sold being electric vehicle of one kind or another. That's very significant, but it's not nearly at the percentages we need to uh, in order to deal with climate change and have some of the other uh, benefits that come from that. Um, and so countries around the world need oil, they need natural gas, and uh, they're looking for those immediate supplies of it. So we need to be uh, both focused on the near-term price points and near-term pressures as we accelerate and really invest even more in the clean energy side of things for the future. So we need to do both of those. And in fact, your former boss, Fatih Birol, at the International Energy Agency has been very clear that the price spike is a natural gas spike. It is not a clean energy uh, a spike or crisis. Uh, and that the solution ultimately is to reduce dependence on the natural gas and, of course, also on the oil and gas. But he's also done a lot of work on the near term pressures on the price of the fossil fuels and how we have to, as you say, we have to do both at, at once. Um, I, I need to ask you about one thing. Um, the, you know, you paint actually a very optimistic picture about the long term um, trend, but part of your empire is the Energy Information Agency, um, the EIA. Now, we've talked a lot about the IEA. Fatih Birol uh, is the head of that, and that's the International Energy Agency. But um, the U.S. has its own called the Energy Information Administration, actually, Administration. the EIA, the Energy Information Administration. And they produce energy futures every year. And every year, you know, I and others have, have looked at them, and, you know, I, I don't want to say we've mocked them, but we've certainly had a few laughs at their expense. But even now, taking into account all of the things you've talked about, their energy futures are for U.S. emissions to come down slightly from where they are, but then to reverse and start going back up around 2035 um, once the kind of low-hanging fruit has come out and then there's economic growth. And so, you know, your, uh, your president, President Biden, has pledged net zero and you're working, you know, we've heard about the initiatives, but your own scorekeeper, the EIA, does not believe in it, seems to be producing these forecasts that then say, well, the best effort, estimate of what's going to happen is it's going to fail. So, so two, two parts of that answer. One, and you know this, Michael, uh, modeling is hard. Modeling is not an easy exercise. It requires an awful lot of skill and talent. And one thing we're trying to do in this administration in particular is invest in those models right, to invest in the models so you can be as accurate as you possibly can be on technology development, right? What, how much additional uh, volumes are we gonna get into the system on hydrogen or EVs or any number of other areas? Uh, what is the price reduction that we've, we've seen, as you said, remarkable price reduction on the solar PV side of things, much quicker than a lot of people thought could happen. What does that mean in terms of other key technologies that right now are at the higher price piece and how can we draw those down on that piece? And then the second piece, and this is something I think gets lost, and we came across this at the IEA and the EIA goes through this as well, is there's different scenarios that are produced. There's different scenarios that are uh, produced. And as long as the assumptions are clearly communicated, communicated in those scenarios, they can be very helpful in that instance. For instance, if you have a status quo scenario that is supposed to show the world, here's where the world is headed if we don't put more policy on the table, if we don't put more ambition on the table. And right now, those scenarios should be a wake up call for everybody because they show exactly, as you said, where because of some uh, price points, because of some other things, we're getting some near term benefits, but the curve will keep going up as the pressures go around the world, as India uh, uh, decarb or as India industrializes further, as other countries in Africa industrialize further. And so those status quo scenarios show we're far, far off from the curve we need to be on, right? The, the IPCC and other curves, the new net zero analysis from IEA 
sharp reductions. The status quo scenarios at best are leveling off, and some of them even have some increasing going forward. So as long as those assumptions are clearly communicated, and it should be seen not as a prediction of where the world is definitely headed, it's a cautionary tale that if we don't do more work, if we don't have more leadership from the US, from the UK, from countries around the world, from China, from India, uh, that's the world we're headed in, but we need to keep going to that world we need to go towards. That's right. Look, I, and, and I was expecting an answer of that nature. But essentially what you're saying is we've kind of got the EIA has produced, you know, four or five different scenarios showing where we're headed. And, uh, and that is failure. What I would love to see, and I think a lot of people would love to see, is the EIA produce a roadmap for what success might look like if the things that you're currently working on uh, pan out or some combinations, which combinations get you there. And at the moment, it just seems strange to have no scenario, no official kind of roadmap that's that's produced that kind of says, look, we can't guarantee we'll get there, but at least this is our best effort of how we how we could get there, how we might get there's two different variants or whatever. So that's what I but but you know I was I was bound to well, raise this with you, right? Well it's 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 a great point, Michael. And we had this similar kind of uh uh argument or or, or position brought forward in the IEA context. And I was very proud of my yeah. tenure at IEA working with Fatih and Laura Coetzee and Tim Gould and others on what they produced, which was a net zero by 2050 scenario, which I think had tremendous impact uh, showing what it really would require uh, to get us to a net zero by 2050 scenario. It, it absolutely did. And in fact, my first ever conversation with Fatih back in uh, 2006 or seven, I think, was saying, why don't you do a sort of stretch aspiration scenario so that everybody could see what it might entail? Uh, but anyway, so that's, look, it's been incredibly interesting getting this update from the, um, uh, gosh, I have to do this without using the words cold face, but from the from the front line of uh, policy action in the US, um, you know, s- clearly still uh, making the weather on a lot of these technologies and a lot of these trends. So I, I, I would thank you for your time. Well, thanks, Michael. And thanks for all that you do. And um, there's an awful lot of work that we need to be continuing to do and even accelerating ourselves from the DOE and the U.S. government side of things, working hand in hand with the private sector, working hand in hand with investors, key countries around the world. And the stakes are so high that, uh, you know, we look forward to pushing ourselves to do whatever we can to help. And, and I believe just finally upcoming, you have the clean energy ministerial or, or, or what other events, what, you know, what, what are your, what's your next big sort of summit point? Maybe who knows if travel well, allows, maybe I'll be able to come and visit. Well, this is a big, big year. And I think the thing that we're focused on the most, uh, certainly from the Department of Energy side of things, is the near term, right? Great that we've got the 2050 commitments off into the future. But what we've seen, and you've looked at the numbers, you're a numbers person in addition, Michael, is uh, unfortunately, as the economies have come back, the economies coming back, of course, is the fortunate part. But the unfortunate part is emissions have come roaring back uh, as well. Coal use is back up. We're seeing some other indicators that are showing that we've not decoupled economic growth from the carbon uh, emission side of things. And we have a critical window here over these next couple couple years where we either bend that curve and we either decouple uh, where GDP is going from where uh, our carbon emissions need to go. And that's where these near-term levers, that's the important work Jigger's doing on the loan program, our Office of Clean Energy demonstration, all these near-term deployment demonstration efforts that we're doing. So we'll be doing that domestically and on the international side, we've got the Clean Energy Ministerial, which you know well, Mission Innovation as well. The U.S. is hosting both of those meetings in September of this year. That'll be an incredibly important milestone. We're participating and supporting Secretary Kerry in the Majors Economies Forum, which they'll have a leader level event in the April timeframe. That'll be important marker as well. We've got the IA Ministerial that, chair, uh, that Secretary Granholm is chairing now in March time period. So there's a number of these key meetings. My hope is we all focus on the near term. What are we doing? What are all of us doing in these next few year period of time to bend that curve and to get us, again, we don't want to be the uh, college student procrastinating until 2045 to do all our hard work. We need to do it now. Very good. And I know there'll be plenty in uh, our audience that will be uh, agreeing and nodding uh, along with you. As you said that, we've got to focus on these next few years. So thank you very, very much for joining us here on cleaning up. Thanks, Michael. It's a pleasure to be with you as always. So that was David Turk, Deputy Secretary of Energy in the United States. My guest next week on cleaning up is Tommaso De Marie. 
He's the CEO and founder of Entropica Labs, and he and I are going to be talking quantum computing. Please join me this time next week for a conversation with Tommaso De Marie. Cleaning Up is brought to you by the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation.